Okay, so um, I was asked to talk about my. I must remember my manners. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> and um, I will say one thing about Ada Lovelace Day, which is that, as far as I'm aware, uh, it was founded by Sue Charman Anderson, who in about 2009 published a challenge that she would write a blog posting for Ada Lovelace Day if a thousand other people would do the same. And it's turned into this enormous kind of worldwide slew of events, and it's it's just really cool. And I mention her because she will come up again later. All right, so, um, so I was asked to talk about sort of my career, the skeptic, and um, online misinformation, I guess. And uh I'll, I'll start with my career because it's kind of the easiest and i i started with some with what today would be astonishing advantages uh and a few disadvantages that i would like to believe don't exist anymore um one was that my parents although they were immigrants in new york in the early early 20th century uh and did not grow up wealthy at all by the time i was born uh, were very comfortably off, or th th my mother would have said, we're comfortable, which meant that they could afford to send me to private school for 14 years. And um, so I went to a very good school just out in, in New York City, and uh, then went to Cornell and came out of all of it with no debt. And and when I look at sort of the burden of debt and difficulty that faces today's 21 year olds coming out of university you know we were so lucky and i think anybody of my age who doesn't recognize that um well should be forced into a re-education or something because you know i i just look at it and it's, it's a staggering difference and the other thing was that in you know when i graduated from cornell in 1975 it was an economic boom time. And so you could do so. You could, you know, if you had a Cornell degree, you could figure, oh, you know, things will work out and you could go be a folk singer for six years. Why not? And I think these are all options that would be very much more difficult to take up now. So I'm, I'm very simple, you know, I'm very sympathetic that you guys are facing a really hard time. And that's not, that's not really a cheerful thing to say, but it's still true. The disadvantage, however, was that my school was divided into a girl's school and a boy's school. And in one sense, that was also an advantage because when you went to a girl's school, um, the assumption was that the girls could do everything. You, know, you could run the student council or you could, you could do science because there was science. But one day my school, when I was about 16, said, we're going to get a computer. Now, in 1970, this is a huge thing. And I said, can we use it? I said, oh, it's going to be at the boys' school. I would like to think that no, no non-boy today would be told that. <laughs> um, so when I got to Cornell, uh, I thought I was going to be a math major. I was always interested in math. I had a terrific math teacher who was very funny in in high school. She uh, she was she was a great explainer. She had all sorts of ideas about about how to make math accessible to people. And um, she spent a lot of time talking about Martin Gardner's uh, computer mathematical games column, which he wrote for Scientific American at the time. And Martin will also reappear in a couple of minutes. Um, every mathematician over 40 in the States reveres Martin Gardner. But anyway, she was the kind of, she was also the kind of woman who would stop she she came into class one day, swore us all to secrecy, made us promise we would never tell our parents, and proceeded to read us the first chapter of Philip Roth's Pork Noise Complaint, which is the author's adventures in masturbation as a teenager. <laughs> this was so she was quite a maverick math teacher. And I mention her because a few years ago on Ada Lovelace Day, I wrote a blog posting about her. And you can find it. Uh, online somewhere. Her name was Nancy Rosenberg. Um, in any case, um, I, as I said, I, as Nicole said, I went on and became a folk singer. Um, I did do some computer stuff in in college, 
Uh, and even then, I was in, sort of intrigued by, there were other women in my computer science class. There were not a huge number of women engineers, but there were some. Um, Cornell has always been a fairly eclectic place. The motto of the campus is, I would found an institution where any person can find instruction in any study. Cornell is really very like that. And I, so I was, again, it was a huge advantage to be in a place where you didn't have to make a lot too many decisions at the beginning. So I went in thinking I was going to be a math major and came out with an English degree. And this, again, is the kind of flexibility that isn't really available in the British education system. And I think that's I think that's unfortunate because I think I think that period of time is when you should be able to experiment with things and 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 find where your true interests lie because most of secondary school you're being pushed around and told do this do that you know. Um, so I came out as a folk singer and the thing about this is if you were a folk singer in the late 1970s what you were hearing a lot of and and what was recruiting on campus was you know transcendental meditation was around Scientology was around uh, you had I guess you had the Hare Krishnas um, and on the folk scene a lot of people were interested in what they like to call old knowledge you know things that people used to believe that maybe should they thought should maybe be revived and so when I came out of this in 1981 uh, I called up a friend of mine and I said it's my birthday tomorrow let's do something new and different and he said I can't I'm going to this lecture demonstration by this guy and I said well what is he what is he lecturing and demonstrating he said well I don't know something about paranormal claims I have to write it up for the alumni magazine I said, that sounds new and different. Let's go to that. So we went to hear James Randi. Uh, this is this is in lieu of slides, we have props. And this is James Randi's book. And he looks like this, uh, or he looked like this in 1981. And James Randi was a former, is a former magician who had devo has devoted his life to debunking paranormal claims. And so he did talks on he, he's in his talk he was talking about why tm was um claims were overblown shall we say he talked about uri geller and spoon bending and he did a demonstration of psychic surgery which is basically pretending to sink your hand into someone's stomach and pulling out a load of chicken guts and pretending that this is surgery and i was absolutely blown away by him i thought he was amazing which he did actually bill himself as the amazing randy so he lived up to his billing and I thought that this was really fascinating. And I went to my friend's house and I said, well, so what's this about? And he said, well, there's this committee uh, called the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. And they started in 1976. And this guy is one of the founders. So he, he showed me some of the stuff that Psychop had sent him. It was founded in 1976. And who are the founders? Well, Randy was one of the founders. Um, Isaac Asimov, who I'd known ever since grade school. I mean, most people remember him now as a science fiction writer, but we used his book on the human body as a textbook in eighth grade. So my first introduction to Isaac Asimov was actually his nonfiction. And Bill Hott handed me this book, uh, which is Martin Gardner, Science, Good, Bad, and Bogus. And remember what I said about my math teacher and Martin Gardner. Martin Gardner was a founder of Psychop. Martin Gardner, you know, and so it's sort of like, wow, it's got to be a good organization if Martin Gardner was involved. <laughs> so this is how you make decisions, you know. It's it you you want to think that they're all rational and stuff, but for me it was kind of emotional connection. And one of the other founders actually was Carl Sagan, which which is a name which maybe means more to um to a lot of people. Uh, I narrowly missed taking his astronomy class, so because uh, he was a te he was a professor at Cornell. So, so this is 1981, and so inspired by these this this organization, I started I started subscribing to their magazine, which is the Skeptical Inquirer. And along about 1985, um, they were they had a, a London conference. And I came, I was living in Ireland at the time, and I came over from Ireland to go to the London conference. And I said, can I help? And 
the secretary of the day said, um, well, I'll get back to you. And he never did. So in 1987, I went to Buffalo, where the committee was. And I said, can I help? And they said, can you start a newsletter? And so here is, here is the very first issue of The Skeptic in 1987. And this is what it looked like. It was a, you know, I printed, I printed it out on a, um, a dot matrix printer. And then we had to photocopy it. This is this is how you did newsletters in 1987. It's practically practically um, antiquarian. Um, but so in nine, so part of the reason I did the skeptic, to be honest, I mean, it was a lot of it was was conviction, obviously, and the belief that starting a newsletter would be a difference to the presence of skepticism in this country. It was also that you know I knew I was kind of interested in living in London at least for a while. I was going to need something as an introduction to people, and the skeptic struck me as a very good way of, you know, sort of getting to know the sort of people that that I was going to want to know. And I will tell you that even now, the skeptic is still the thing that opens doors for me. And so there's there's a lesson in there somewhere about starting something that will matter in the long run that you can build on and and go back to over the course of your career that's yours, or at least that you can remain part of, um, but that isn't necessarily somebody else creating a job for you. Um, so by 1990, I was living in London, and a contact through the skeptic got me some work on a computer magazine. And you know, I think that was a bit of luck, because in 1990, computers were obviously still a, a hugely growing growing industry and, and I knew about the internet I had read about it I had um, I had friends who were on it and um, and I I think around I think when I finally sort of got online for the first time which was in in, in 1991 basically I convinced a computer magazine to let me review some online services and then I said oh and can you lend me a modem <laughs> and maybe a laptop <laughs> and um, you could do things like that then. and um, and you know, I sent my first email to a researcher at IBM, and I thought this is the future of communication. This would be a good area to specialize in. And so here's one piece of advice: I have a friend who founded a consultancy that worked worked on government-related um, technology. He was really basically trying to spread new technology and new new uh, new ideas for running services into government. Uh, and he eventually sold it. And it, but the thing he says that he learned from his his lifetime mentor, who was Anthony Jay, one of the writers of Yes Minister. So the thing he learned was, if you get into a fast moving area, there will always be somebody who is willing to pay you to explain it to them. And that strikes me as a really useful useful thought. Um, and the internet was at that time very fast move very fast moving indeed. And um, in night, you know, sort of a couple of years later, I, I, did, I did a piece on computer crime. And that led somebody to tell me to call this guy that I'd never heard of in Washington, D.C., either D.C. or San Francisco, who was involved in something. So I call up this guy. And he starts telling me about the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which has just been formed. Now, you may not know what EFF is now, but now, 30 years later, EFF is this really important digital rights organization in the States. It has done a lot to try to keep get good law passed and keep bad law from sticking to the things that it shouldn't stick to. And they've defended a lot of unfairly accused people. Um, and it's generally been a really important organization. But at the time, it was like six months old. And the guy I was talking to is a guy named Mike Godwin. And if you've never heard of Mike Godwin, look up Godwin's Law. Uh, he was he was the first cyber cyber rights lawyer. And so that's kind of the amazing thing about being in the beginning of something is then you you, you look back 30 years later and say, wow, if I were starting this now, I would think these guys were just way out of my league to talk to. But you know, you've known them for 30 years, and it's just Mike. <laughs> um, and 
so at the time the big the big social medium of the day was usenet and unlike today's social media usenet was not owned by anybody and um one of the publications i was writing for at the time was interested in thinking about running a column of sort of selections of content readings from usenet sort of idea and i think i think they didn't expect usenet to be quite as quite as um well, you know what Facebook, you know what the nether reaches of Facebook are like. I mean, Usenet had all of that. Plus, you know, it was it, it was a pretty contentious place to, to hang out. Um, but in the process of trying to put this together, I came across uh, a news group called alt.religion.scientology. And I thought, well, now we've got a lot of science fiction people on the net and science fiction people are the most uh disbelieving of Scientology and this is going to be a really this is going to be a really contentious place to look for interesting things to maybe report on and so I started looking at alt.religion.scientology and this was the moment when uh some former Scientologists had started posting the most secret scriptures from inside Scientology on the net and Scientology was trying to flood the flood them off the net by posting like lots of PR stuff. And it turned into this enormous battle. People, people's homes got raided. I mean, it, it turned into this huge thing. And the results of that, um, I was a piece that I did in 1995 for Wired uh, about Scientology versus the net. And the, the, the point about this is that, you know, at this point I was, had been, you know, involved with skepticism for more than 15 years. And I'd been involved with sort of computers and it was kind of what became computers, freedom and privacy that I still call net wars. Um, and this was the first indication that they were going to merge. Uh, you know, the skeptic was really founded to debunk things that really shouldn't people shouldn't really be wasting their time on in a way. Uh, alternative medicine was always an important thing. Uh, but at the beginning of this, at the beginning of the skepticism, what you had were people making paranormal claims, like Uri Geller claiming that he could bend a spoon with his mind, or uh, mediums who claim they can talk to the dead. Uh, and there's an obvious lot of potential for ex exploiting people there. And so that was why a lot of us thought it was worth doing. But you know, after a while, the, you know, when you when you sort of read your tenth article debunking astrology, you sort of think, you know, haven't we kind of isn't this done by now? Do, do we really need to keep doing this? And so Mike Marshall, who has recently taken over the skeptic, which in its most recent incarnation looked rather like this, if you sort of think about the difference. This is this is this is the history of desktop publishing right here. That a small press magazine, this is what you looked like in 1987, because that's all you could afford. And in, what is this? I don't know, the 2010s, this is what you could look like. Um, Mike Marshall, who has just taken over the skeptic, um, thinks that there were three eras of skepticism. The first was this kind of old and discredited beliefs, new age, um, and so on. And the second, which started around 2000, was contested science, where I mean, climate change is a good example, where it, it wasn't clear that scientists agreed on it at that time. And of course, now we know that the reason scientists didn't appear to agree on it was that companies like Exxon were sowing doubt uh, as a deliberate policy. Um, but you know, things like you you may be amazed to realize this, but you know, it's only only 20 years ago. People were still arguing about whether mobile phones cause brain cancer. And it was that kind of contested science where you sort of started saying, well, what, what is the logic here? And Mike believes that we're moving into a new era where the thing that dominates is conspiracy theories. And I think that's really interesting because when you think about sort of the kind of fake news that's being distributed. A lot of it is playing on people's fears. But all through, through all three eras, alt-med has been a really, alt alternative medicine has been a really important thing. And uh, I don't think any of us, 
I, I wonder sometimes whether, you know, the fact that the anti-vax movement is now so big is an indication that the skeptics failed entirely. Because, you know, this is an organization that started in 1976, and it has gotten much bigger, and there's a lot more examples of, of skepticism in the world. And yet, you know, you sort of look at, you look at where we are with people uh, contesting science, where the president of the United States gets up and un tries to undermine a world, his world leading expert who is actually just trying to save lives. I mean, people are sending Anthony Fauci death threats for trying to save people's lives. I don't get it. I mean, this is, this is a very strange world we're living in now. So sort of many of us don't like to use the term fake news because Trump has turned it into something you blame the New York Times for being. Um, but I think, I think Scientology versus the net was really my first case of, it was really, it was a found, founding case in a lot of ways. People don't know this, but it was the Scientology actions on the net were the thing that eventually led to the cases that settled, that, that created the, the, the laws and norms around intermediary liability, for example. Um, but it was also the first example of somebody trying to tell the truth and somebody trying to completely suppress it using the online medium and using the, the affordances of the online medium to, to push out both sides. And today we see this going on all over the place. And one of the things that I think is unfortunate in the way a lot of people approach the problem of online misinformation is that they treat it as if it were a single phenomenon. And I think here it has a lot in common with cybersecurity, where people talk about cybersecurity and they, they sort of say, you know, depending who you talk to, somebody will say, well, cybersecurity is having, having a different password for every website, or it's making sure you're fully patched, or, you know, but when you sort of start to look at how, what the threat is really, in cybersecurity, you start to realize that you need an enormously cross-disciplinary response. You need things like psychology, education, um, international relations, political science, social science, even philosophy. Um, and for the last 10 years or so, I was involved as uh, the in-house writer for the Research Institute for Science of Cybersecurity, uh, RISCS, R-I-S-C-S.org.uk. Um, it was founded by Angela Zassa, who is one of the first people to um, to push uh, usability in security. And I know that uh, my understanding is that you guys are all involved in, in usable software issues, which was a, a big concern of mine in the 1990s. And I wrote quite a bit about it early in the early 1990s. Um, at, and... Um, one of the problems with security is people make these policies that are completely unworkable and uh, then people can't stick to them and you create bigger bigger vulnerabilities for for outsiders to exploit and so the reason <clears throat> the, the reason i think that that fake news well misinformation and cybersecurity have this in common is if you think about it there are many motives why people attack computer systems, but there are just as many motives in why people spread misinformation. Um, people in one of the things they found in studying the 2016 uh, EU referendum here and the uh, presidential election in the States was that a lot of postings were, were sent out just to foment division. Uh, and you know, you have state actors who want to who want to undermine Western society by fomenting division. And so sometimes sometimes the postings they'll send has happened to a friend of mine is quite divisive within the community. But people repost it because they agree with it. And it's very difficult to disentangle that because it's it's not actually that the posting is untrue. And it's not actually that they don't agree with it and that they're trying to provoke people. It's that by posting it and repeatedly posting, you foment these disagreements and means that groups can't work together for the common goals that they have.
And so it kind of undermines that kind of activism. Um, and people, people sell bad ideas and products. They may want to just manipulate people towards a particular point of view. They may just be trolling in personal entertainment. Ha, <laughs> look what I got him to think. Uh, or just getting attention. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of this stuff starts with somebody saying, oh, if I post this contrarian view, people will pay attention to me. And frankly, that has been a trend in the British media. I mean, I mean, the mass media and news, newspapers and television that goes decades, you know, so you get somebody like, you know, deciding that, that being contrarian on climate change is going to get them attention, is going to get them paid. And so they do it and they don't really care that, it, you know, and Boris Johnson himself, his journalism career is a great example of this. Um, and a lot of these things, you know, the, the as in as in cybersecurity, um, the people posting this misinformation have huge variations of what resources they have available to them. Uh, they may be a casual poster, just you or me, who passes on something that we think is surprising or interesting. Uh, and, or they may be well-resourced state actors. I mean, there was the story of the Macedonian teenagers in 2016 who were posting all sorts of ridiculous stories because they, they figured out they could get paid for it. Uh, the Washington Post just a couple of weeks ago had a story that there are a bunch of American teenagers who are posting all sorts of crap because the Republican Party is paying them to do it. Um, you know, it's that the the big problem we have is not just that misinformation spreads online, but that we have world leaders who don't care whether what they say is true, and who are willing to say anything at all if it appeals to a few people who will vote for them and i don't know how i don't know how you counteract that by just thinking of misinformation as this online problem and i think and i really do think that one of the problems we've had with it is like journalists have written a lot about online misinformation and when you ask a journalist the journalist says fact checking we need fact checking well Fact checking is one piece, or we need we need uh, literacy. We need literacy, so education. Well, education is important, but it's only one piece of it. Um, a lot of the people who are against vaccinations at this moment in time are very well educated. I have a friend who went to Cornell at exactly the same time I did. She is very close friends with my closest friend, and she believes in homeopathy. And she is a rabid anti-vaxxer. And I recently had a piece of correspondence with her, and I think this is actually part of the key to, to the future. I had a piece of correspondence with her. She had sent me this message asking if she really should be worried about 5G. And it was this kind of garbled email with a lot of different pieces of 5G, Bill Gates, um, and vaccinations i don't know and so i sort of i sort of went through it methodically and i said well 5g does pose you know 5g poses some problems but uh no it's not it's not going to rot your brain um i'm not sure the privacy issues are worse with 5g than they are than what we have right now and bill gates is really just trying to do this and um, but she mentioned depopulation, and I really didn't know what she meant by it, and I still don't really know what she meant by it. But a few weeks later, um, George, Mon I don't know how he pronounces his name, whether it's Monbiot or Monbiot, uh, in The Guardian, ran this piece about why um, focusing on population control is really not not the issue in climate ch in controlling climate change, and uh, you know. And I sent it to her and I said, you know, I don't know if this is what you were talking about, but I thought you might find it interesting. And I got back this message, this tearful message about that she felt I'd seen her and I wasn't treating her as stupid. And, you know, what struck me was that in the course of sort of developing these beliefs, my friend had increasingly been treated as an idiot. I had no idea by the people. Now she's obviously not an idiot. She has a degree from Cornell. 
everybody who came out of Cornell actually worked for their degree. You don't, there are no honorary degrees at Cornell. And they let in legacy people, yes, but only if they're, if, only if that's the last point of contention between two candidates, you know? And so sort of like, and she, you know, so, so this is something that Mike Marshall is also pushing is the notion, he says, you know, a lot of people say, my feelings don't care about your facts. No, but a lot of people say my facts don't care about your feelings. And that's absolutely true. Um, you know, you, you don't, you don't get to decide uh, just, just because you like this idea, you know, the, the nice homeopath who is, who is, who spends time with you rather and you, when your doctor doesn't, doesn't make him write about science. Um, and that's, that's absolutely true. But Mike has been finding increasingly, he's done investigations into things like flat earth beliefs, and he's got a just terrific talk on YouTube about it. And you should look it up. Um, he said he he says the converse is also true that my feelings don't care about your facts and this is this is really true i mean if you think about generations of smokers who couldn't be dissuaded from smoking be, with the, th the threat of lung cancer uh if you think about um generations of people i had a there's a there's a great clip up on cnn this guy went around a trump rally asking the Trump supporters to show him what they were seeing on their face pages. And this guy comes up with this, this video of, see, look, Joe Biden fell asleep in the middle of an on-air interview. And he shows him the clip and he says, well, actually, um, you know, if you look here, you can see that that clip was faked and it's not really a true clip. And, and the guy says, oh, yeah, 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 you're right. I guess it is fake. Huh. Does this change how you think? No. <laughs> you know. Emotionally, this guy has somehow connected to Trump. And so, Mike, this is kind of the latest trend in skepticism. And I think it has lessons for fake news or for misinformation online as well. But if unless you can connect with the emotional engagement with these things, whatever it is behind the reason why this belief is so appealing. You're not really going to get anywhere just by trying to debunk things and persuade people with facts, because we're not we're not in a time when people respect facts just because they're facts. Um, and and it's very I find that very sad because truth really matters to me, and I actually do think that science is not at all perfect science is a process it's not something you just put up there and, and and admire science is an endeavor it is something that i don't know how many scientists there are in the world hundreds of thousands millions um but it's an endeavor that involves millions of people in trying to come up with the best approximation of an understanding of the world that we can come up with and the fact that we find the mistakes and we correct them is just an enormous, enormously powerful thing. And I find it very sad that so many people are rejecting it, sometimes for a good reason, because their particular group has been badly treated by science. And I think certainly women could tell many stories of how medicine, for example, failed women. Uh, and, but the answer to me, to me, the answer there is to improve the practice of science and to improve the quality of the scientists that conduct it. And I guess the value of the skeptic, insofar as it has value, is to keep alive the sense that science is not just something that people with degrees and people who are trained in science can do, but that there is enough of it to go around to include even amateurs and people with degrees in English. And I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. Um, it was quite interesting to gain a bit more insights in, in your career path and also in what the skeptic does and um, your um, view on misinformation. Um, 
we are now we now have a bit of time for questions so feel free to um raise use the raise your hand button if you want to ask your question in person or post it in the chat as well um and i can also um read it out as well so while you are thinking about questions um while well, writing them up um i will start with one so the story about your friend i know we spoke about this uh, as well before the story about your friend who's um you know who's an anti-vaxxer but you said like she's not stupid well obviously she's not stupid how do you deal with people like that i mean it's you know you you still love them like the the, the on a personal relationship matter but do you kind of feel um i don't know maybe attacked by um their opinion sometimes because you know they're kind of it seems wrong or um you just live and let live um how do you um, well i think it would be hard if she were having her kids now because you know you would you you would feel the sense of wanting to protect the children from things like measles and stuff um i i don't know if she had them vaccinated at the time i i've been meaning to ask her out of curiosity uh the the current version of that i have a i have a friend who lives in pennsylvania which as you may know is a swing state and he is traditionally voted libertarian and i find that very odd because he has the soul of a democrat when you when you talk to him he's he's one of the kindest people in the world and yet you know he talks about well he likes small government and he's against wealth transfer and you sort of say but you do realize that like if you vote libertarian this time you're you basically could be handing handing the presidency back to trump and i think part of as as we've talked about this like i'm trying to persuade him that this once he should vote democrat <laughs> and as we've talked about it i've come to realize that one of the problems is he reads a rupert murdoch newspaper he reads the wall street journal and the stories that don't get covered in the wall street journal i think have left him with this impression that that no government is particularly better than any other government so while he decries what's going on in the states it's not it's not clear to him that biden would make any difference and you sort of try to say well he would make a difference because he's not trump and and you know so he came out with you know do you realize that he said he said you know there was a this woman in the irs in the internal revenue service during the trump administration sorry during the obama administration who was caught abusing her power in investment i looked up the story is perfectly true but it doesn't mean what he thinks it means because there's one woman in the irs who abused her power in the current administration the entire family is stealing money from the, from the u.s treasury and these are not equivalent and so the problem of false equivalence is a really big problem for us also is 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 that what is reported and who reads which media makes such a difference and for that i actually do blame rupert murdoch to an, to an extent it's not entirely him he doesn't own the daily mail for example but um so how do you deal with it but i mean basically i mean you know you the same way that you deal with an alcoholic or or anyone else who engages in behavior that is difficult to, to live with is that you separate the human from what from what they do and from necessarily what they think and you sort of assume that the human being is as a human being that you interact with on a daily basis is generally a good per you, you don't write them off as a bad person because they think think or do something that you don't like you sort of say they did something i don't like and they believe this thing that i don't like and maybe and and when you're not always going to be able to say that but at the moments when you can you can say you know i really didn't like that you did this or uh, you know i'm really uncomfortable with this thing you keep saying that's my best best offer mm -hmm. thank you very much well, of course, uh, in the chat um maybe a partner wants to read it out as well yeah make it Is Aparna going to read it? 
Um, I thought I'd let you read it because there's a lot to read out and it'll be easier for you to like attack each part of the question <laughs> if it's there on the chat. <laughs> okay. Cross disciplinary I said that cross disciplinary action is required to tackle fake news. Universities in Europe especially particularly focus on courses directed to technical skills. Do you think we should promote a more whole grounded learning in university or is it better to be focused on your degree program as is the case now? Um, well, that has, it's both a disadvantage and an advantage of the US system that we are encouraged to study more broadly than just the degree program. At Cornell, if you were doing a math degree, you would nonetheless be required to take a writing, to take a couple of writing courses. You would still be required to take some, uh, I don't know, language. I think the requirements when I was in school were something like you had to do, so you had to do a language, you had to do, um, I mean, a non-English language. You had to do, um, which is actually interesting. Well, never mind. Um, you, if you were if you were studying science you had to you had to do some humanities if you were if you were doing an english degree you had to do some science um and i think i do think that that approach produces better rounded individuals and i think particularly as going forward i think many many areas of science are going to require people to collaborate across disciplines with people whose disciplines they don't understand very well I think having a little, at least some smattering of base, basic knowledge of that discipline will be an advantage, um, partly because the language varies so much from discipline to discipline. So if you've had a, cert, a basic grounding, if you're a computer scientist, but you've had a basic grounding in biology, I would like to think that would make you more effective at collaborating with biologists. So I do think it's unfortunate, but at the same time, uh, you know, kids come out of four years of college in the States with just massive amounts of debt. So, you know, it's it's really tricky. Uh, you know, it's, it's a more compressed program in the in the in the European Union and in the UK. But maybe maybe financially, that's what's going to be sustainable. I don't know. Um, but I would say uh, read as widely as you can among things that aren't necessarily obvious. I find Twitter is just an amazing resource for people suggesting interesting books of different types. You know, Twitter, Twitter is just, I mean, people, people always say how, talk about Twitter as accessible, but honestly, if you follow the right people, you get exposed to so much knowledge that you wouldn't necessarily encounter otherwise. And I, right now I'm following a whole lot of epidemiologists, but, uh, you know, I've learned more. I somehow over the last three or four years, my Twitter uh, feed has expanded to include all sorts of scholars. It started as an algorithmic bias, which Jenny was talking about so well yesterday, and it's sort of now I've got all these people talking about um, non-white bias in all sorts of fields and aspects, and you know stuff that I probably would have encountered eventually anyway, but that has come at me in this kind of very compressed way, which has been really useful. Um, there was the other question. Fake news, news and media involves people seeking attention and trolling. Is there anything we can do as individuals to tackle this? Because it's very... Um, I actually do have a set of recommendations for how, how to sort of... how to not contribute to the problem. Um, and one is to exam to be in touch with your own emotions. The more excited or enraged you are by something you want to repost, the longer you should pause to think about what it is you're going to spread. What is the source? What are their motivations? Are they just trying to exacerbate divisions in society? Are they just seeking attention? Um, whose interest does this claim serve? For example, you know, right now there's all these there's all these uh, you know herd immunity. Heard of me? Nobody's talking about her. I, I wish I could, you know, every day, like 15 people say, no one's talking about herd immunity. And my sense is everybody's talking about herd immunity, and it's still a really bad idea. And I say this is some 66. You know, I, I'm way better health than my mother had at 66. But, you know, uh, I would really resent having the next 30 years taken away from me out of some kind of idea that, <laughs> that let's kill all the old people. Um, when you design systems, 
assume they're going to be abused, especially when the user base reaches about 10,000. Um, beware of your personal cognitive biases. And if you don't know what cognitive biases are, Wikipedia has a bunch of fantastic entries on them. And uh, really, look, really think about them. Uh, use checking sites like Snopes. Uh, and keep your interest, we've already touched on this, keep your interest as broad as possible and, and apply common sense to things. And, uh, and I've written here, no matter what career you have in mind, learn to write as well as you can because it will always be advantageous, which is not really about fake news, but is nonetheless a useful piece of advice. Uh, if people continue to not believe in facts, how can we persuade them to still do the right thing? Um, how do we reach out to them? I think we have to reach out to them by people, the, the things that they care about. Um, I, I, I don't know. You see, this is where the anti-vax thing is suddenly interesting. In the period when Trump started talking about, we're going to get a vaccine out right away, we're going to rush it out, it was actually completely logical to say, not sure I'm taking his vaccine. And so you can't just say all vaccines are good. You have to say these vaccines are very well proven. You know, and um, coincidentally, I never had measles. And I got vaccinated against measles last year. And, and the number of younger people who say to me, why weren't you vaccinated as a kid? Well, because when I was a kid, you didn't have a vaccine. People just got measles. <laughs> Only I didn't. <laughs> and I thought it'd be a really dumb thing to uh, die of. Science communication does not reach the broader population. Do we need to fundamentally change how we communicate science and facts? I think that's a really good question. And I think, I think, we, I think we actually may. Um, we have been very fortunate over the last number of years to have some very charismatic people who are able to communicate science. Uh, in the States, people like uh, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, and um, and in this country, I guess Brian Cox and Robin Ince and Richard Wiseman have done a lot of great shows, you know, sort of making science fun. Simon Singh is doing a lot to push <clears throat> to make uh, math accessible. Um, I, th I think it really, in the end, it, it, requ it really does require these personal connections and these charismatic, charismatic individuals. And I think that's, that's a hard thing to say because we're, the charismatic individuals are always in limited supply. And everybody now is thinking, you know, how do we, how do we scale everything? And I think that's actually the the thing is that because the computer industry always talks in billions of people, you know, like your thing isn't valuable unless it scales. We forget the value of really small scale things. I'm involved in, a, or I was until the lockdown started, I was involved in a group called the Talking Newspaper, where a bunch of people get together every Friday and read the newspaper into USB sticks, if you could imagine. And they're sent to like uh, tens of people around my local area. And you sort of sit there and go, you're doing this for what, 50 people? And, you know, you're used to thinking in billions and 50 people seems really, really small. And is that really worth it? But actually, it makes a big difference to those 50 people. And I think reclaiming those personal connections and finding, finding which is really hard to do in a pandemic, um, but reclaiming those one-to-one -one connections and that sort of hard graft of person by person sort of trying to explain maybe why we think the way we think also, you know, like not take it as a given that we're right and they're wrong, but present it much more as here is how I went on this journey and arrived at this place. How did you go on your journey and how did you arrive on that place? And, um, a friend of mine's neighbor in the States has been emailing me all year, sort of trying to find common ground between this very liberal New York woman and this very conservative Pennsylvania guy. And the reality is we agree on most things. 
We just don't agree on abortion. <laughs> um, do you think journalists that separate personal biases from the piece they are working on is that unavoidable? Um, I think the mythology that journalists can be completely unbiased in writing about anything is mythology. Um, I personally, I think it's better to know what the journalist bias is so you can correct for it. But there are a lot of layers to that because um, someone like Rupert Murdoch does not get his newspapers to reflect his beliefs in life by sitting over the journalist and saying, you must write this. He hires editors who think like he does. And the editors hire journalists who will write the way they want. And um, there's a difference between going out as a journalist with a particular, you know, like I have a particular set of values about the internet and computers and freedom and privacy. And when I write stories, I'm going to write stories that reflect those biases simply by what I choose to cover. I don't tell people. I don't like to tell people what to think. And if somebody tells me something that's contrary to my to what I, that doesn't mean I'm not going to include them in the story. Uh, Linda Grant is a great example of this. In the 90s, she called me up one day and she, she was she was asking about the skeptic and and you know it was a piece about I don't know various beliefs. And at the end of it, sort of maddened, I, I, she, you know, she said, she's talking about women's networks and these things. And I, I said, you know, it would do women a lot more good to get online and, and use the Internet th than to join these networks, th than to join these groups. And she dutifully wrote the quote down and she put it in the story. And a year later, she called me back and she said, you know, you said this thing to me and I believe it. And I thought you were nuts. I just got online and oh my God, you were right. <laughs> and, you know, but the point is she acted as an honorable journalist. She didn't cut the quote. She did put it in. Whereas several times in the early nineties, I got, call, I got a call from the, some BBC researcher who said, we need somebody to go on this program and say that online is dangerous for women. I said, well, that's ridiculous. I said, you know, it's, it, the online is dangerous. You can you can log off and you're done with it. Whereas if you're in a parking lot at two o'clock in the morning because you have to go home, I mean, you know, that's a lot riskier. And they didn't want to hear that. And so I didn't get on the program. And there's, you know, that's where I draw the line is you cannot let your bias dictate what the story is. But you can let your bias choose what stories you choose to cover. Um, fact checking how can one be sure the source is reliable and independent source claiming to be should probably not be enough I agree with you and I think that's one of the really difficult things we do all tend to trust Snopes because Snopes has done a really good job for something like 25 years um, and I think you have to look at how they build the case and who do they whom do they cite and what is you know, that's why fact checking was hard, is there are a lot of aspects to it. it. You can't just say, well, it was in the New York Times, so it must be right. Uh, there are very few publications that are correct all the time. And even the New Yorker has been caught once or twice. But I would say of the publications that exist on the planet, the New Yorker has been probably caught in fewer errors than any other magazine. It's extraordinary. Um, yeah, it's very difficult and you have to look at, you have to look at the evidence, you have to look at the preponderance of the evidence, you have to look at people's track records. And so then you start to get into how important is this particular thing to debunk and what are the consequences of letting it slide. And the late uh, political uh, columnist Simon Hoggart had a great line about this, which is that Belief in astrology and stuff like that bothered him, he said, because it was a kind of white a background noise interfering with the truth. And that was nice because it kind of gave some justification to debunking these things. But, but, but you know, in any relation, you know, if you, if you go back to the personal relationship again, you're going to have to let a few things slide once in a while. Um, critical thinking. I actually think that, it, it, oh, sorry, I should read the uh, It seems like critical thinking is key to, oh, this is from Nicole, 
as far as I know, is key to combating misinformation. As far as I know, it is attempted in secondary school, but not really pushed through. Should we be starting earlier? Yes. We're teaching critical thinking and skepticism, or should we just do a better job? Yes, I actually do think that um, education has been um, certainly in certain areas of the United States, education has been starved. And I was talking about this with, with somebody the other day who said, oh, yes, an, a, a poorly educated public is much easier to manipulate. And um, personally, I would like to see much more resource and much more effort go into improving the quality of education. Um, but I do and I do think that that it, by conservative governments in both countries have, have starved it much more than they should have. Um, and whether the motive there is that it is easier to ma manipulate, I couldn't say. Um, but yes, and I, but you know, I think I think it does come down often to who your teachers are. Um, one of the best bits of uh, education I ever had was in tenth grade, so I would have been about fourteen or fifteen. And the teacher in this case started off our year of modern European history by handing us a copy of Josephine Tay's novel, The Daughter of Time, to read. Now, Josephine Tay was a mystery novelist, very good one. And The Daughter of Time, her detective is stuck in a hospital with a broken something or other, and he is brought, he's brought a bunch of photographs to look at, and he picks out the photograph of Richard III and starts investigating whether Richard III really killed the princes in the tower. Now, Richard III has had an apologist in every single decade, I think, since he died. And Josephine Tay was that decade's apologist, and she did not believe he was guilty. Uh, she pinned it on Henry VII, um, who had motive and opportunity. Um, but what she asked us to do was to read this novel and then make a list of all the supporting evidence and all the contradicting evidence for this theory. And it was a really wonderful exercise in thinking about how is this case built and how is it presented and where would you go if you wanted to investigate it further. By the way, that teacher's name was Lee Whedon. And she is better known to you as the mother of Joss Whedon, who created Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, one of the things you can look for in fact checking, it occurs to me to say, is transparency about where they get their information from and what process they use to, to, to check things. Snopes is really quite meticulous in laying out why why they're rating it one way or another and um so i think that's why a lot of people respect them also don't underestimate wikipedia as a source a lot of teachers will say oh you can't trust wikipedia it's written by by people but the actually great thing about wikipedia is you can go behind every page there is the page that shows how it was discussed how the page was built what changes were made when and you can, you can, it's a wonderful teaching tool for how to curate a single piece of knowledge. I think we're at the end of the questions in the chat. Uh, yes, I think so too. Thank you so much, Wendy, for um, also answering all those questions in so much detail um, and also for your talk in general. Um, it's an honor to, um, to have you speak at our event. I'm glad um, you still think so. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> Um, I'm sure everyone else agrees too. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and I think we're also at the end of our time as well together. So we'll have like a couple of minutes um, before the next session starts where we have Becky um, from Tech She Can um, talk about a project that she's working on. So, um, Wendy, if you're keen to join, you know, um, please, you're very welcome. Thanks. Uh, if not, you know, as it works, I'm going to, um, yeah finish this session now I think um yes another round of applause if you want to unmute yourself um or just thank you very much it's, it's thank you fun. so much um for uh yeah for the lovely talk and